Good day, I'm Brian Farrell, and welcome to Pace IT's session on Configuring Switches, Part 2. Today we're going to discuss installation considerations, and then we're going to move on to configuring the switch port. There's a fair amount of ground to cover, so let's go ahead and dive into today's session. Of course, I'm going to begin with installation considerations. The first installation consideration is whether or not you need a managed or unmanaged switch. The business or enterprise network is more complex than the small office home office network. A SOHO network may be able to get by with using one or more unmanaged switches and still operate adequately. But once beyond the level of a SOHO, more thought and planning is required as unmanaged switches are no longer up to the job. You are going to need managed switches. There are multiple issues to consider when installing a managed switch and it is wise to plan for those in advance to save both time and frustration in setting up a network. One of the first things to consider is if there will be VLANs, Virtual Local Area Networks. While switches may break up collision domains, they do not break up broadcast domains. But VLANs will. A virtual local area network takes a single network environment and creates smaller network segments by subnetting the network address range, effectively breaking up the broadcast domains of that network. VLANs are used in a switched network environment for a variety of reasons to break up broadcast domains into smaller segments, just like I just said. Another reason to use VLANs is they increase security by limiting access to network resources. The administrator configures the VLANs and then assigns users, nodes, or ports to a specific virtual local area network. All managed switches do come with a native VLAN, which is determined by the manufacturer. This native VLAN is used to help manage the switch. VLAN traffic is allowed to cross switch ports as long as the VLAN information matches. So VLAN 2 can send traffic to VLAN 2, but VLAN 2 cannot send traffic to VLAN 3. VLAN traffic is allowed to cross switch ports as long as the VLAN information matches. It does this through the use of trunk ports. That means that VLAN 2 can send traffic across a trunk port to VLAN 2, but it cannot send traffic from VLAN 2 across a trunk port to VLAN 3. VTP, or Virtual Trunk Port Protocol, is a Cisco proprietary method of creating a virtual trunk port, which allows VLAN traffic to pass between switches and to automatically manage the VLAN environment. In order for different VLANs to communicate with each other, a router or some other Layer 3 device must be installed on the network. The next consideration is how is the switch going to be managed? Switches may be managed out of band. That means that no network connection is required. This is achieved through the use of the console port on the switch. The console port is a specific port on managed switches used to connect to and configure or manage a switch. A rollover cable may be required to make the connection to the console port. Security should also be set on console ports to prevent unauthorized access through that console port. Your other option for switch management may be to use in-band management. With in-band management, a network connection is used to manage the switch. One of the most common methods of allowed in-band management is through the use of virtual terminals or VTY connections. The most common VTY connections are Telnet or Secure Shell Sessions, SSH Sessions. Security should also be set if Telnet is allowed on VTY type connections. By default, SSH is a secured connection. If you determine that you're going to use in-band management, the next thing that you need to do is to establish a default gateway address. That default gateway address must be placed on an interface that belongs to the native VLAN, or the default virtual local area network. The default gateway on a switch is different than the default gateway on a router. 
On a switch, it is only used to manage the switch and not to pass other network traffic. As part of the setup and management of the switch, an administrator should configure which users and passwords are allowed to connect to the switch and what their level of access to the configuration is going to be. In-band and out-of-band management security settings may be different. Some users may be allowed in-band management access, while others are not, and vice versa. If authentication, authorization, and accounting protocols are used in the network, the switch must be configured to use them as well. With that done, let's move on to configuring the switch port. I'm not going to actually show you the commands for how to configure the switch port, but I'm going to give you the information that you need to consider when configuring the switch port. First up is speed and duplexing. Most modern switch ports can auto-negotiate both the speed of the link and the duplexing mode used. But in some cases, an administrator may be required to manually set both the speed and the duplex in order for a connection to occur. Speed and duplexing errors are the most common cause for a link not being established between a switch and a router or between switches. Next up is VLAN assignment. All switch ports will belong to a VLAN, and that VLAN will either be an administrator configured one or it will be the native virtual local area network. As a side note, the native VLAN can be administratively changed which should be done to increase the security level on the switch. Then there's trunking. Trunk ports are switch ports that are designed to carry VLAN traffic between switches. The standard protocol used is 802.1Q. 802.1Q strips off the VLAN tag. Actually, it changes that tag to match the native VLAN, which allows the traffic to cross over the port. And then once on the other side, then the 802.1Q port on the other side reinserts the original VLAN tag. And that is trunking in a nutshell. You might want to consider port bonding using LACP. That's Link Aggregation Control Protocol. It is a protocol that is used to create a single logical channel from redundant connections between switches. So it bonds those ports together. This will increase the bandwidth between the switches. Now we're going to talk about Poe. Not Edgar Allan Poe, but Power Over Ethernet. Some switches come equipped with Power Over Ethernet ports, or PoE ports. These ports can use one of two methods to provide current over the network cable, as well as carrying data. Allowing these ports to power small network devices while at the same time communicating with them. The port itself may provide the current, or the port may allow the use of a power injector to provide the power instead of the port itself. There are multiple PoE standards in place. The two most common are actually the PoE standard, the 802.3AF, which can provide up to 15.4 watts of current, or the PoE Plus, which is 802.3AT which can provide up to 30 watts of current. Port mirroring may also be enabled on a switch port. This allows the configured port to receive all network traffic going to and from a specific port. By using port mirroring, an administrator can examine and analyze the traffic going into and coming from a specific host or port. Port mirroring is most often used in conjunction with a packet analyzer, also known as a packet sniffer or network sniffer. Administrators often use port mirroring to examine the flow of traffic to determine what method of network optimization to use or for when they're determining which security measures to put in place. Port mirroring can create a significant amount of network overhead, so it should be used sparingly on an active network and you may want to shut it down once your research has concluded. That concludes this session on configuring switches part two. I talked about installation considerations and then I talked about configuring the switch port itself. On behalf of Pace IT, thank you for watching this session and I look forward to doing another one.